Good evening. My name is Chris Arnold, and on behalf of the Bob and Alicia Woodrick Diversity Learning Center at Grand Rapids Community College, we're pleased to have you here tonight for our 16th annual diversity lecture series. And it is quite an honor to have Mr. Stephen Pathero with us here this evening. Um, I'd like to send, extend some greetings from President Ender, who was unable to be here with us tonight. And I, uh, however, we are delighted to have several of our board members with us here tonight. We have um, Dr. Richard Reiskamp, Ms. Jan Magini, <clears throat> Mr. Richard Verberg, and we do have Ms. Karen Under with us here tonight, so thank you for being here. Our Board of Trustees work very hard for our college and our community, and um, we certainly appreciate their support of our diversity initiatives. Now I'd like to just take a moment to acknowledge our generous sponsors for the lecture series. This series really would not be possible without the support that we get from our sponsors in our community. Our champion sponsor is Steel Case, and we have Ms. Deb Bailey with us here tonight. Deb. Our diversity advocates include Warner Norcross and Judd, Diversity Partners, Amway, Davenport University, Michigan Radio, SMG Management, DeVos Place, Spectrum Health, the Nokomis Foundation, and Varnum. And there are many um, supporters listed in your program as well. Again, we're very grateful for all these friends and supporters. And for those of you who are interested in supporting any of our programs through the Diversity Learning Center, we certainly welcome that opportunity um, through our, our foundation here at the college. I'd like to also thank the GRCC diversity team for their continuing commitment and, and um, <clears throat> special thank you to Diversity Learning Center staff, Jennifer Smith, Tamber Moore, and Kathleen Owens, and all the volunteers here with us tonight. And um, a really special thank you to Fountain Street Church and their staff here, um, Heather and Melissa and Travis for hosting us. Isn't this a wonderful venue? <clears throat> Then for those of you who parked in one of the GRCC ramps, you can pick up a parking pass, which will get you out of the ramp at a discounted rate tonight. You can pick those up at the information table. And um, please do take a moment to fill out your evaluations. Your input is very important to us. If you have a suggestion for a speaker or a topic that you would like to have us consider, um, we welcome that input as well. This is our 16th year of the series. And we are very proud of our history of offering diverse voices to help engage our community in global and local viewpoints. We see social equity as a way to create safety and support for each other. I hope that many of you were able to read Charles Honey's column where he detailed his interview with tonight's speaker. And he happens to be here with us tonight. Where is he? Thank you for being here. I thought the conclusion of Mr. Honey's column spoke to the core mission of the Diversity Learning Center and the series. He said, listening to new perspectives may help us to learn to respect differences rather than judge them, and then move beyond to work for the values we share. I am proud to represent the college and the center as it, as it works to promote the understanding of multicultural and social equity concerns as a centerpiece of GRCC and the core mission of the Diversity Learning Center. And as we listen to each other to promote respect and offer perspectives that contribute to the health and well being of our community. And now I am pleased to welcome one of our sponsors and a friend to GRCC, Mr. David Luna, Vice President of Multicultural Affairs at St. Mary's Healthcare. Again, we welcome you and we look forward to seeing you at our um, lectures in February and March. Mr. Luna? I don't really need any applause. I just have a minor part to play here. Um, 
As Chris said, I'm very happy to be here this evening, and St. Mary's Healthcare is very happy to be one of the many sponsors of, of GRCC's Diversity Lecture Series. This series uh, continues to bring, uh, on a continued basis, fresh perspectives to our community, um, ideas, fresh ideas that we can all contemplate and think about and have dialogue about, and that's a very good thing. Um, well, uh, when Chris, when I found out that uh, Stephen Prothero was coming to speak early on, um, I asked Chris, well, how can I be involved? And she said, would you like to introduce him? And I said, certainly I would, because I'm a huge fan. Uh, besides, uh, even though I am the diversity officer for St. Mary's, a good Roman Catholic institution, I myself am a practicing Buddhist in the, in the Southern tradition. I'm also a distance learning graduate student in religious studies uh, at one of the British universities, so I am very pleased to have this honor tonight. Um, Stephen is a professor of religion at Boston University and specializes in American religions. He received his BA in American Studies from Yale and his MA and PhD in the study of religion from Harvard. He has written or edited six books to wide acclaim. His account of the life of the pioneer American Buddhist, Henry Steele Alcott, won the Best First Book Award from the American Academy of Religion. His American Jesus, How the Son of God Became a National Icon, was named one of the top religion books by Publishers Weekly. His book, from which tonight's presentation borrows its title, Religious Literacy, What Every American Needs to Know and Doesn't, spent several weeks at the top of the New York Times bestseller list. And his latest book, God is Not One, The Eight Rival Religions That Run the World and Why Their Differences Matter, is as we speak sitting at the top of Amazon's bestseller list in the religion and spirituality category. In addition to his books and articles for scholarly journals, Professor Prothero has written for the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, Los Angeles Times, and Boston Globe. He has commented on religion on dozens of NPR broadcasts and on CNN, NBC, CBS, and PBS. Newsweek called him, quote, a world religion scholar with the soul of a late night television comic. <laughs> and Variety, referring to last month's broadcast of the PBS documentary, God in America, said that he, quote, emerged as the program's talking head star. Without further ado, Stephen Prothero. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, David. Thank you, Chris. Um, thanks to GRCC uh, Diversity Learning Center for having me here and uh, the Fountain Street Church. I was reading this list of people who have spoken here, it's pretty intimidating. Um, I'm not sure, by the way, I like any description of me as a talking head, even if it's followed by the word star. But I'll, I'll take that. But I was thinking I could, I could teach a course just based on people who have spoken here, a course in American religion from the Civil War on. I could do the social gospel with Walter Rauschenbusch and the Nation of Islam with Malcolm X and the Power of Positive Thinking with Norman Vincent Peale and goofy Asian religion interest with Alan Watts <laughs> and the, the battle between science and religion with William Jennings Bryan and Clarence Darrow. So. Uh, that's intimidating. I'm, I'm delighted to be here, though, and I'm really glad that you all came. What I'm hoping to do today is to talk a little bit about the religious literacy, illiteracy problem I think we have in the United States, and then to talk a little bit about the past, how that came to be, and then to present a modest proposal about how we might attend to this problem, which I see not simply as a religious problem, but as a civic and political one. In other words, one that challenges us as citizens rather than one that challenges us merely as people of faith or people without faith. But I thought before I did that, I would say some, a little bit about how I became interested in 
this problem of religious illiteracy and how it started to grab me as an issue that I might want to think about and want to write about. And that happened to me when I moved from Atlanta, where I had my first teaching job at Georgia State University, to Boston, Boston University. And I noticed when I was there that my students didn't really seem to understand what I was talking about. I had the impression at Georgia State that they did. I'm not sure that was right, by the way. But um, once I got up to BU, I had the sense often that they didn't. I would say something about the Gospels or about the Bible or about Judaism. And I would notice that they would give me, uh, they would give me the look. And I, I think you all know what the look is. The look is how you look when someone says something and you know you're supposed to know what they said, but you don't know what they said, and you don't want them to know that you don't know <laughs> what they said. And the look goes something like this. It goes... <laughs> and, and I just noticed that uh, my students were giving me the look. And I would say Matthew, and they would be thinking, Matthew Perry of, of Friends? <laughs> and so I found myself saying, you know, for example, in the Gospel of Matthew, which is one of the four Gospels, which is in the New Testament, which is part of the Christian Bible. <laughs> um, and I would, I would just find myself kind of doing these iterations of explanation. And so I started to wonder, you know, what do my students really know about the world's religions? And you, in teaching, you want to try to start, it's one of the truisms of teaching, you want to try to start where your students are. So I said, you know, I need, I need to do a better job of evaluating where my students are. And I decided to create this religious literacy quiz that some of you were handed out on the way in. And I gave it to my students at the beginning of my Intro to Religions courses. I should have given it at the end, by the way. I didn't have the guts for that, but I gave it at the beginning. And what I noticed was what I expected, which is that my students knew very, very little about their own religions, and they knew even less about the religions of other people. I had Catholic students who couldn't name any of the seven sacraments of Catholicism. I had Protestant students who couldn't name the first book of the Bible, who couldn't name any of the four Gospels. I had Jewish students who who didn't know Genesis is where the biblical text began. That one of the things that struck me particularly about the quiz was that I had a section at the end where I asked them to connect the dots between characters in Bible stories and the stories themselves. So if you have a sheet, you can see I would have, for example, Adam and Eve in one column, and then I would have the Garden of Eden in the other. And their job was to draw a line between Adam and Eve and the Garden of Eden, indicating that they knew that that's the story in which these characters appeared. So in my students' defense, they did a pretty good job with that question. But on almost all the other biblical stories, they did very, very poorly. So we had, you know, Paul on the ark waiting for the dove. <laughs> and we had Noah being blinded on the road to Damascus. And we had Moses sacrificing his, his son Isaac. And we had a lot, of, a lot of quiz answers that just took the name Jesus in the left column and just connected it to everything in the right column. You know, figuring, I've heard of this guy, and uh, maybe he was involved in this story one way or, or another. And so then I, then I thought, okay, I've got two daughters. I, I've got some children. What about them? How are they doing? What do they know about religion? And I, my father was a medical doctor, and he didn't like to bring his work home. He had a very strict sense. I'm, a, you know, I'm working a lot of hours. When I come home, I don't talk about medicine. And I realized that I had adopted the same sort of thing. I'm a religious studies professor. I'm going to come home, and I'm going to talk about you know, the Women's World Cup. I'm not going to talk about religion. So, you know, what do my kids know? So I remember I was at Bible Sunday at a Lutheran church on Cape Cod. And Bible Sunday is the Sunday when 
the families and the congregation make good on the baptismal promise to put the scriptures in the hands of the baptized children. And so at a certain age, in, in this church it was second grade, you have a ceremony where the kids come forward uh, and they, who have been baptized in the church, and this, a Bible is given their parents, and they hand the Bible to the child to sort of begin their education in, toward biblical literacy. And so there I was holding the Bible, and, and it was one of these uh, children's Bibles. It was a, a Bible with a picture of Jesus on the cover. Um, Jesus was surrounded by children. He had a lamb on his shoulder. He was a white guy. He, he actually looked like me, pretty much like me, but with a beard. And uh, so I, I got the Bible, I handed it to my daughter. She was very proud. And so as we left church, I thought, okay, teachable moment. Let's have a conversation. And I was in the car and I was driving and I said, all right, well, let's talk about the Bible. And she said, okay. And I said, I want you to tell me about some characters in the Bible. And she said, okay. And I said, uh, but not Jesus, that's too easy. And then she Gave me, gave me the look. <laughs> and then um, I said, tell me some characters in the Bible. And then she, uh, other than Jesus, and then she started to cough. <clears throat> and then, then she, she waited, and then she coughed again. <clears throat> and then she said, Tom. And then I said, Doubting Thomas, right? Maybe he was Tom to his friends. <laughs> but, uh, but that was it. That was it, Jesus and Tom. <laughs> so, um, so next week, next week, um, in the car, driving back from Sunday school, let's try it again. You know, so this was the week when uh, Moses got mad and hit the rock in the desert and the water came forward. And so my youngest daughter, the Tom, Tom one, um, she was ready. She was going on and on about Moses. Moses was a baby, he was in the bulrushes, he was left, he was found, he was in Egypt. They were slaves. He told the Pharaoh, let my people go. The Red Sea, parting the Red Sea. The armies came behind. You know, wash behind, he, he, his, the people got across, the Ten Commandments. She was going on and on about Moses, really proud of her. And then I asked my older daughter, who was in uh, probably at the time in like seventh grade maybe. This is a good, you know, liberal Protestant church in New England. And I said, you know, what did you learn today from this story of Moses, you know, hitting the rock? And she said, you know, we learned about the water cycle. We learned uh, evaporation, condensation, and precipitation. So shortly after that, I was talking with an Austrian friend of mine who had come to Boston University to teach. He was very excited. He was an expert in Orthodox, Christian, uh, Orthodox Catholic relations. He was, a, he was a Catholic. He was actually advisor to Pope John Paul II on relations with the Orthodox um, communion. And he was so excited. Coming to America, he was going to teach these students all about the history of Catholicism and Orthodoxy and how they interacted and what they shared, where they differed, blah, blah, blah. He looked all forlorn. He's like, Steve, you know, all my students go to church. And he said, none of them knows anything about Christianity. In Austria, it's just the opposite. None of my students would be caught dead in a church, but they know all sorts of stuff about Christianity because they've had religious education from basically K through 12. And so this helped to solidify for me the main um, argument of my religious literacy project, which is that the United States is one of the most religious countries on earth, and yet Americans know almost nothing about religion. They know very little about their own religion, and they know even less about the religions of other people. 
Now, when I was working on this, this book, I didn't have a lot of data on this. There was a question asked here and there in different surveys. People who survey on American religion, they almost always survey about beliefs, and they sometimes survey about practices, but they hardly ever survey about religious knowledge. I found one study in 1967, I believe it was. The question was, do you know the Ten Commandments? And the answers were yes and no. <laughs> so you just say, yeah, I, I know the Ten Commandments. Okay. So there wasn't that much data, but I did find some surveys that indicated, for example, that most Americans do not know that Genesis is the first book of the Hebrew Bible. That only a third were able to identify Jesus as the person who delivered the Sermon on the Mount. Many of them thought that was uh, Billy Graham, and that was, <laughs> survey was taken. 10% of Americans, I found, um, thought that Joan of Arc was Noah's wife. <laughs> That's good that you laugh, because sometimes I say that and people are like, yeah, I know. <laughs> and um, a sizable minority, you know, think that um, Sodom and Gomorrah were a happily married biblical couple. <laughs> But just a few weeks ago, in fact, in September, there was a survey that was released, the first survey of religious literacy in the United States. It was done by the Pew Forum, and it was released in late September. It's called the U.S. Religious Knowledge Survey, and they asked over 3,000 people a series of questions, 32 questions, about Christianity, the Bible, and the world's religions. And it was a lot easier than my quiz, easier than the quiz I handed out to you tonight. And on average, Americans got 16 out of 32 questions right, which is half. The Pew Forum refused to make any judgments about that. And then they, um, people came and asked me, and I said, well, that's an F, you know, 50%. That's failing. It was interesting that the group that did best is atheists and agnostics. That was a nice little jab to, uh, oh, yes, we have some atheists and agnostics here. Yes. All right. So um, they did the best, followed by Jews and Mormons. Catholics, by far the worst. <laughs> um, but what intrigued me more was the overall, well, what intrigued me were really two or three things. The, the first was that people didn't know their own tradition. So when, on, when the survey asked, you know, in Catholicism, the bread and the wine, in the, in the Mass, is that, is that just kind of symbolizing the body and blood of Jesus, or does that in some way become the body and blood of Jesus? And, and Catholics didn't know this. Similarly, Protestants, when asked about Martin Luther, you know, who's the guy of the following four figures, who's the guy who kind of got the Reformation going, key figure in the early Reformation? Um, less than half of Protestants were able to name, to name Martin Luther. So that was one thing, people not really knowing their own traditions. Pew didn't ask uh, if the Pope was Catholic, but the closest question to that was, is the Dalai Lama a Buddhist? And um, we found out, or no, what is the religion of the Dalai Lama? And we found out that less than half of Americans, 47%, were able to identify the Dalai Lama as a Buddhist. 45% of Americans were able to name the four Gospels. President Obama has been in Indonesia. There was a question on the survey, what is the religion of the majority of people of Indonesia. Indonesia is the largest Muslim population country in the world. And only 27%, about a quarter of Americans, knew that Indonesia is a Muslim majority country. This is hugely important if we're thinking about this conversation about after 9-11, you know, where are the moderate Muslims? Well, over 100 million of them are in Indonesia but we don't even know that Indonesia is a Muslim-majority country, so we don't know to look there. So that's the problem. Now, this problem is a religious problem for religious people, for evangelicals who want to foster biblical literacy in their ranks, for Catholics who are concerned about Catholic illiteracy, for Jews who want their children to be raised up in a tradition where they know the beliefs and rituals and share the memories that Jews have passed on for millennia. But my focus in this project and here tonight is on religious 
illiteracy as a civic problem. So what do I mean by that? I see two civic or political issues around our lack of understanding of the world's religions. One is domestic and the other is international. On the domestic side, we now have two political parties, our two main parties, that are now religious parties in the sense that politicians in those parties both are eager to talk about their faith and they're eager to connect religious beliefs, particularly Christian and biblical ones, with public policy initiatives. Now, we used to only have one political party that did that. In the late 1970s, the Republican Party decided that as part of its strategy of taking on the 60s, taking on what they understood to be the libertinism of the sexual revolution and, and rock and roll and drugs, that they would focus on family values and they would connect what we now call cultural politics to the Bible, to Christianity, to Jesus. And they would do that pretty explicitly. This was a good strategy in a country where at the time about 80% of Americans identified as Christians. At the time about 95% of Americans said they believed in God. The Democratic Party, I'm not sure exactly why, decided that it would be a good strategy to be on the other side. In other words, on the side of the 5% who don't believe in God. Um, and they said, we will not talk about God. It is inappropriate to talk about Religion is private. We will not talk about that in public. We will not make connections between our public policies and the Bible. They said that over and over again for over a generation in the midst of the Reagan revolution. They said that during the John Kerry campaign for president, when John Kerry refused repeatedly to talk about God and about his faith. And the only time he did, one of the few times he did, all he said was, I was an altar boy when I was a kid. Which is the kind of thing you say when that's the best thing you can say about how, how uh, Christian you are. Um, they changed their strategy with when Obama was running. They changed their strategy, the Democrats. They decided they were going to talk about God. They had a debate with all the Democratic nominees for the presidency. And they got together and they were asked questions about what they believed about God, what they thought about the Bible, how they connected the Bible to public policy initiatives. Hillary Clinton repeatedly talked about her reasons for opposing Republican initiatives on immigration because they violated the Good Samaritan story. Because if you listen to the Good Samaritan story, it's about taking care of the other. It's about taking care of the foreigner. And how could we turn in the foreigner in our midst? If we're good Christians, we, can, we have to reject this immigration policy. So we now have two parties talking about Christianity and the Bible. If you look at the congressional record, you'll see thousands of references to terms like golden rule, Armageddon, apocalypse, good Samaritan. A lot of times politicians on both parties now, when they talk about abortion, when they talk about stem cell research, when they talk about euthanasia, when they talk about same-sex marriage, when they talk about even now poverty, and when they talk about war, they connect their views, their public policy views, to views about Christianity and the Bible. How can we engage these people? How can we see if they're making any sense? How can we challenge them if we as a public and the journalists among us don't know anything about the text that they're evoking? It becomes like this sort of, sort of halo or like sacred cone over their heads that they get to just invoke and say, I'm a good Christian politician, so I believe this about abortion, or I'm a good Christian politician, so I believe this about capital punishment. And we're not able to engage them. And I think what our literacy does here is it, it creates a sort of gap between us and our representatives, and it gives them license to continue to use religion more and more in cynical ways in the public space. And we can't distinguish between people who are genuinely giving voice to their religious convictions in the political space and those who are cynically using religion for, for political gain. So the danger here is to our democracy. The danger is, as Jefferson and other founders said, you know, the way forward in a democracy is always with an informed citizenry. If the citizens are uninformed, then what's the benefit of democracy? The international challenge in terms of religious illiteracy 
is even graver, because here it's not a matter of a functioning democracy, it's a matter literally of life and death. If we look abroad and we try to make sense of what's going on in the Middle East, we try to make sense of what's going on in Kashmir, or what's going on in Myanmar, or what's going on in China, or what's going on in Sri Lanka, you can't do that without some understanding of the world's religions. And this is where we shift from a focus on the Bible and Christianity, which are the main religious drivers in American political culture, to traditions like the Hinduism of India, where President Obama just was, or the Islam of Indonesia, where President Ob Obama has been visiting, or the Confucianism of South Korea, where he's headed. How do we make sense of what's going on in these hot spots in the, in the world without knowing something about these traditions? We had a huge wake-up call after 9-11, where we realized as a nation that we all of a sudden needed to know something about Islam, and we didn't know anything. And so we had a debate about Islam, which was basically people on the secular, or people on the left saying, you know, uh, Islam is a religion of peace, and people on the right saying, Islam is a religion of war. And then we advanced that debate by having the people on the left reiterate that Islam was a religion of peace, and the people on the right reiterating that Islam was a religion of war. And then the counterargument was, Islam is really a religion of peace. And the counterargument to that was, Islam is really a religion of war. And that was all we could say, because we didn't know anything about the tradition. Nothing. So we couldn't have a public conversation about it. We couldn't, we couldn't, we didn't, there's no, there was no way to know if the people who were saying Islam is a religion of peace were just naive, idiotic, liberal fools who were going to take us down the path to ruin or whether the people on the right who were saying Islam is a religion of war were just hawks who were using Islam as a vehicle for their you know, neocon aspirations. In other words, we couldn't engage because we didn't know anything. What we need, it seems to me, is we need to have a conversation about religion that is civil and that is informed. And unfortunately now we're missing both things. We're having an uncivil and uninformed conversation about religion. Whether you are religious or not, whether you believe in God, God or not, whether you're a Christian or not, it doesn't matter. Because the world is what it is, regardless of your particular faith or lack thereof. And the world as it is is a furiously religious place. It's a place where people are moved by their beliefs about God, by their understandings of scriptures like the Bhagavad Gita and the Analects of Confucius, and the Bible to do things, to do things economically and to do things politically. And we can't understand what they're doing, we can't understand their motivations without knowing something about the religions that, that drive them. So, um, how did this happen? How did it happen that we broke the chain of memory that used to transmit religious knowledge in the United States from generation to generation? This is where I put on my historian's hat, and this is where those of you who hate history, and if you're Americans, that means almost all of you, um, might want to take a nap, or you might want to uh, have a little Vipassana uh, moment of, of watching your breathing instead of listening to me. I know when I, um, when I went to uh, college, I said I was going to take every area of study except for history because history was boring. Or as my students say to me, it's just stuff that happened in the past. <laughs> so, but I, I, but I am a historian, and so I have to indulge myself a little bit. I spent about 90% of my efforts writing my book, Religious Literacy, on the historical chapters. I have two chapters explaining how it is that we, we dove so deep into this, uh, the dregs of religious illiteracy. Um, and I, I noticed reviewers spend 0% of their time talking about that. But I will, if you will indulge me, I'll do a very quick riff. And the riff is this. The traditional line that you hear is often comes from the religious right. And the argument is, is that Americans forgot about religion when the Supreme Court banned religion from the public schools in the early 1960s in two landmark cases in 1962, in 1963, when they said it is a violation of the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment for teachers to lead students in devotional prayer and for the Bible to be read as a Christian devotional text. 
that's when it all went downhill. In other words, secular people in the judiciary put religion out of the public schools and therefore out of the minds of young people. That's why we know nothing about re uh, religion today. The argument that I make in the book is that that's wrong in almost every way. It's off by about 100 years. And the people to blame are not secular people, but religious people. It was religious people that got rid of religion, that banned religion from our heads, not secular people. So how does that work? Well, what happened in, there's sort of two stories to tell. The first has to do with the public schools. When the public schools are established in the early 19th century, everybody is reading the Bible. Of course they're reading the Bible. One of the main points of the public schools is to create moral citizens. How can you create a moral citizen without inculcating religion? Because there's no morality without religion, was the view. And the only real religion was Christianity. And the source of, of Christian knowledge was the Bible. So, of course, you would have to teach the Bible in the public schools, and, and every public school did. And this was fine for a while, because there weren't enough complainers. There weren't enough people to say no. There weren't enough atheists. There weren't enough Buddhists or Hindus. But around the middle of the 19th century, you start to get in some American cities, places like New York and Boston and Cincinnati, enough Catholics to ask the question, why are my, why are my kids reading the Protestant King James Bible in school? That's not the real Bible. The real Bible is the Catholic Bible. The real Bible has footnotes. It has footnotes from dead people telling you what these passages mean. How are ninth graders going to know what these passages mean without some footnotes from dead people telling you what they mean? We have a whole tradition of people who have thought for centuries about what these passages mean. Why aren't we listening to them? And so we had what we would call the Bible Wars. And the Bible Wars were about which Bible would be used, not whether there would be a Bible, but which Bible would be used. And the upshot of the Bible Wars was that in many places, Catholics and Protestants agreed to get rid of the Bible because the Catholics couldn't allow the wrong Protestant Bible to be taught and Protestants couldn't allow the wrong Catholic Bible to be taught. Religious people pushing the Bible out of the public schools. The other story, parallel story, has to do with transformation of American religion. The dominant impulse in American religion in the colonial period into the early national period into around the 1830s was Puritanism. Puritans were those we now think of, you know, Hawthorne, Hester Prynne, stodgy people who didn't have any fun. Um, but one thing that they did that in my view was great was that they understood that religion was about both the head and the heart. They understood that to be a Christian was to wrestle not only with your feelings, but also with your intellect. They thought that God spoke through both. They thought that you needed to read the Bible over against your own experience and your own um, emotional states. <coughs> and so there's always this challenge to reconcile the head and the heart. And what happens with the rise of evangelicalism, which replaces Puritanism as the dominant religious impulse, what we now call born-again Christianity in the 1830s, is that the locus of religion moves from this kind of di dynamism, dialectic between the head and the heart to the heart itself. Religion becomes about feeling. It becomes more important to have a relationship with Jesus than to know what Jesus says in the Bible. It becomes more important to love God than to know God. In fact, knowing be starts to become suspect because what religion is about is intuition and feeling and emotion. And so the Christian tradition moves itself away from teaching the Bible. It moves itself away from teaching about its own traditions. And more and more it becomes an emotive and a moral enterprise. An emotive enterprise about having, cultivating a certain kind of feeling and a moral enterprise about creating a certain kind of society. 
And each of those impulses, the moral impulse and the emotive impulse, takes us away from that old dialectic of the Puritans of trying to wrestle with how God speaks to us through the head as well as the heart. So religious illiteracy comes from religious groups as well as from secular decisions by the Supreme Court. Now I should say that this is all in reference now, this loss, this decline, this loss and cutting of the chain of memory is in reference to the Bible and Christianity because we never in American history knew anything about Islam. We never knew anything about Judaism, very little. I mean, we knew a little, but we never knew anything about Hinduism or Buddhism. So the kinds of religious, religious literacy we need for today, we never had before. But we used to know a lot about the Bible. We used to know a lot about Christianity. And if you go back and you look at the debates about the Civil War, the debates about the propriety of slavery, those were conducted almost entirely on biblical terms, and the public was extraordinarily sophisticated, ordinary people about what the Bible said about slavery on both sides. It was not slavery is bad, says the Bible, slavery is good, says the Bible. I mean, people could talk about what Paul says in his letters about slaves obey your masters and about the letter from Onesimus about Paul returning the slave. Why is he returning the slave? Well, because he thinks slavery is okay. No, he's returning the slave because he expects the slave master to, to deliver up the slave and let the slave be free. No, no, no. I mean, they were able to talk about that. They were able to talk about how is slavery different among the Israelites from how it is with us, how it's racial now. It wasn't racial then. Oh, they had the Jubilee year when the slaves were freed. That's different. We don't have that. They were able to talk about these. They were able to talk in a sophisticated way about what the Bible said about public policy questions in the way that we can't do anymore. Okay, so there, here it ends the history part. Now, if you've been um, just watch, following your breath. You, you, it's, it's safe. You can come out now. No more history. So what to do about this? Talked about the, uh, the problem, talked about the past. What's, what's my proposal? I think we need to do a better job of educating ourselves and our children about Christianity, the Bible, and the world's religions. And I think that should start in the public schools. I think we should have mandatory courses, a mandatory course on the Bible and a mandatory course on the world's religions. Because I don't think you're an educated person if all you can say about Islam is that it's a religion of peace or war, depending on which pastor or which politician you're listening to. I think if you can't, if you don't know the Good Samaritan story, you're not an educated person. I think that this um, education about the world's religions needs to look, and this is the focus of my, my new book, um, God is Not One, needs to look not only at the similarities of religions, but at the differences as well. There's been a big tendency, particularly in popular writing about religion over the last 50 years, to talk about how religions are different paths up the same mountain. Yes, there's differences, of course, but those differences are inessential. Those differences don't matter. At the heart of religion, religions are basically the same. In other words, you go up the mountain, you might go up different paths, and you get to the top, it's all the same. Now, the problem with this view is if you ask people, well, what's at the top? I think they're going to have to say something. And what they're going to say is going to be particular. And it's not going to be something that everyone else agrees upon. So Karen Armstrong will say, um, compassion. All the religions are about compassion. And not only do they share the same ethic of compassion, but compassion lies at the heart of each of these traditions. Someone else might say, the mystical experience. Sure, religions are different with ordinary people, but the experts, the most exalted in each tradition, they're having the same experience. And that's where the religions converge. They're essentially the same because of that. Or all these religions, their ultimate is really just a different name for God. And that's what's at the top of the mountain. I think the religions are different. And I think the only way to respect them is to respect the differences that they speak of. If a Christian says Jesus is the only son of God, I don't think it's my job as a scholar of religion to say, you don't really mean that. 
you know, what you really mean is, and then translate it into a language where that statement becomes so innocuous that every Buddhist, Hindu, Muslim, Confucian, Taoist, Protestant, Catholic, Jew in the world can agree to it. If a Muslim tells me the Hajj is one of the five pillars of Islam, I don't want to say to them, ah, you don't really mean that. It's not really a big deal. You know, what really matters is compassion. What really matters is the mystical experience. What really matters is God. And by the way, you don't get to define God because I'm going to define it in this overarching world religion-y universalist sort of way, in a way that now becomes un unrecognizable to you. I think the people who have insisted on speaking about the unity of the world's religions have bought into a view that is very similar to the clash of civilizations view, which I reject. And the clash of civilizations view says, where there is religious difference, there will be war. There has been war where there's been religious difference. And in many cases, it's been horrible. But the, the existence of difference doesn't mean inherently that there is going to be conflict. And I think it doesn't help the situation to pretend that the religions are the same. I think it's condescending to religious people. I think it handicaps us and makes it impossible for, un to, for us to understand the religious conflicts that beset our world. And I think the view that all religions are different paths up the same mountain fails to respect and appreciate the unique beauty of each tradition. If Christians already know everything they need to know from the Christian tradition, why should they learn anything about Taoism or Judaism or Hinduism? It's just the same. It's essentially the same. It's a repeat. So I think the education we need about the world's religions needs to be informed, yes, by the similarities. We need to understand that Judaism, Christianity, and Islam all share the notion that there's one God. They all share the notion that God speaks to human beings that God created the world and God will come at the end to bring world history to a close, that God is a lawgiver, that God is a judge, that God speaks through prophets, that the prophets write down the, the, the speech of God in books that become understood to be revelation. That's a lot. But Judaism, Christianity, and Islam differ on a lot of important things. And those three traditions differ hugely from Hindus and Buddhists and Confucians and Taoists, none of whom understand God in the way that I just described for those three Western monotheisms. So I think we need to teach about the world's religions in the public schools. I think we need a Bible course in the public schools. The objections to this proposal are typically two. Um, one is, the most common, is that it's unconstitutional. And really interesting to me, the most interesting result of this survey from the Pew Forum in September for me, because I knew how little Americans knew. I wasn't surprised by that. Um, I wasn't surprised by the way the atheists did best on this survey either. But what, what did surprise me was a gap on three questions that were asked about religion in the public schools. When American adults were asked, can teachers lead a prayer in a public school? 89% of Americans knew they could not. Unconstitutional and illegal. But when asked, can a teacher read from the Bible as an example of literature? Only 23% knew that was constitutional. And when asked whether you could teach comparative religion in the public schools, only a third, 36%, knew that that was constitutional. This is just wrong. This is just, this is not true. If you, if you look at, uh, the Supreme Court rulings on religion and education, the Supreme Court has been very explicit. They've made a distinction between teaching religion and preaching religion. You can't preach religion in the public schools. You can't preach atheism either. You can't tell the students there's God. You can't tell the students there's no God. You can't tell the students Jesus is the son of God. You can't tell the students Allah is the final prophet. You can't make any religious proselytizing or preaching. You can teach the Bible. You can open the Bible and read it and say, this is the account in Genesis of creation. This will show up on almost every book on Oprah's book list. <laughs> East of Eden, Song of Solomon. 
This is, this is a story you need to know to understand almost every painting in every Western museum made before 1950. This book, you can do that. And you can teach about the world's religions. You can't say, here's the course about the world's religions. Its point is to make you a Buddhist. Its point is to make you realize Hinduism is the one true way. No, you can't do that. But you can say, this is what Hindus believe. This is their scripture. Let's read it. This is what Buddhists do. Let's talk about that. And this is not some crazy liberal guy from Massachusetts coming up with an insane understanding of the, what the Supreme Court has said. The Supreme Court has been ex really explicit about this. So, for example, in, in the Supreme Court case, Abington v. Shemp, 1963, the court writes in its majority opinion, nothing we have said here indicates that study of the Bible or of religion, when presented objectively as a part of a secular program of education, may not be affected consistently with the First Amendment. And then continuing, one's education is not complete without a study of comparative religion or the history of religions and its relationship to the advancement of civilization. What is the court saying? The court is not just saying it's allowable, it's permissible, it's constitutional to teach the Bible and the world's religions. The court is saying it's imperative. There's no constitutional bar to uh, teaching about the world's religions. The other argument is ma it, that's made is it's too controversial. Religion's just too controversial. We can't talk about it in public. Look what happens when people talk about religion. They just start to fight. And this is when I say that you're watching too much television. <laughs> because when people talk about religion on TV, that's what they do. Franklin Graham gets asked on CNN to talk about Islam. Why does he get asked? Because he's an Islam expert? No. Franklin Graham doesn't know anything about Islam. He's a Christian preacher. Asking Franklin Graham to come on TV to talk about Islam is like asking the CEO of Coke to come on TV and talk about Pepsi. He's not going to say nice things. So he gets on and says the bad things about Islam, and then they get some like liberal guy to come on and say the nice things about Islam. And you have a kind of uncivil and uninformed conversation about religion. But out there in ordinary America, in places like Grand Rapids, and in places like Sandwich, Massachusetts, where I live, in places like Modesto, California, where a population with a, a large percentage of born-again Christians and a large percentage of Hindus and Sikhs, Indian Americans, got together to create the country's first mandatory world religions curriculum for ninth graders. It wasn't simple. There were some disagreements, but there's no like smoke rising above Modesto. It's not creating you know, the apocalypse in Modesto that their kids are now learning that when the president goes to Indonesia, he's going to a Muslim majority country. And when the president goes to India, he's going to a Hindu majority country. And when Warren Buffett and Bill Gates go to China to try to get philanthropists to give money, they're walking into a culture where you make decisions about giving or not giving money based on Confucian values, not based on Christian values. So it's not too controversial to do. The culture wars are much more alive on television than they are in ordinary American places. I think we need to do a better job teaching about the world's religions at, at colleges and universities. We don't do enough with it. Harvard had a great opportunity a few years ago to institute a new curricular emphasis on religion and ethics, which was turned down by some scientists who believed that religion was stupid. And so why should Harvard students have to learn about something as stupid as religion? In other words, they assumed that religion didn't matter in the world because religion didn't matter to them. That didn't serve the students at Harvard, and it doesn't stir, s serve students in other places. What can we do ourselves <clears throat> to try to educate ourselves about the world's religions? Well, one thing we can do is talk to one another. Um, 
if you've looked at the Pew survey, you would know to not take everything as if it's gospel when you talk to your friends, because <laughs> they might not know that much about their own tradition. But it's a good place to start. We can read the Quran. We can read the Bible. I have a Cliff Notes version. I guess we don't call it Cliff Notes anymore. What's it called? Spark Notes. Spark Notes. Version of the Bible. If you don't want to read the whole Bible and you want to get some biblical literacy, you can read Genesis and Matthew. Just those two. My, this, my recommend this shortcut because you can get about 90% of the references that are made in public to the Bible if you read those two books, because that's where most of the main characters appear. The Gospel of Matthew is really long. It has most of the parables. Most of the stories that we know best are in the Gospel of Matthew. The Gospel of Genesis introduces all these you know, major characters like Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel. A bunch of the storyline of the, of the Hebrew Bible is there in the Gospel of Genesis. So, okay, that's, um, I'm running out of time. As my students say, uh, that's just me. You know, what about you? <laughs> so I think we have time for questions. We have, we have two mics. You should feel free to come up and uh, ask, if you have a question, and ask a question as long as you don't make it too hard or uh, you disagree with me in any way. <laughs> um, but with those caveats, you know, feel free, um, feel free to come up and uh, pose a question to me. Our first intrepid questioner is coming down the aisle here on, the, on my left. Hello. Hello, doctor. I truly applaud your efforts. Is this mic working? Can you hear her? OK, great. Hello, doctor. I truly applaud your efforts to teach about the great face of the world. These type of lectures will help inspire interreligious understanding and cooperation. Before asking my question, I want to read a couple of excerpts from a book that supports many of the ideas that you've spoken about tonight, and then ask a question for your comments. I promise I'll be brief. If we are continue the era of people, if we continue to the era of people congregating together only by religion or race, then humanity cannot avoid a repetition of war. The age of peace absolutely cannot come unless we transcend cultural customs and traditions. No ideology, philosophy, or religion that has influenced humanity in the past is capable of bringing about the peace and unification that is needed for the future. It is urgent that the struggles of modern ideologies, cultures, and races be overcome through interreligious understanding and spiritual harmony. How is this to take place? First, respect the traditions of other religions and do everything possible to prevent conflict and discord among religions. Second, all religious communities should cooperate with each other to serve the world. And third, the leaders of all religions should work together to develop a structure that will let us accomplish our mutual mission of establishing world peace. The author states that these goals can be achieved through, among other things, public education that includes religious studies as part of its core curriculum. These quotes are from the book, As a Peace-Loving Global Citizen, by Reverend Sung Myung Moon, founder of the Unification Church. Doctor, what do you think will happen in the future if we don't teach world religions in all public schools and universities? Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm not sure I remember the whole question, but I will try. Um, at the beginning of the quotation, I was disagreeing profoundly, and by the end, I was agreeing more. I think at the beginning of the quotation, there was a hope that I think is not only naive, but misunderstands uh, the way human beings are in the world, that we would have some overarching religion that isn't one of the religions, but is somehow an umbrella on top of them. And this has been tried many times. 
The classic um, two of them in the American tradition, Disciples of Christ. No shout out for the Disciples of Christ, like the atheists. We have more atheists here than Disciples of Christ. <laughs> and Mormons. Both efforts to say, you know, there's all this squabbling among the religions. Enough with that. Let's just be Christians. Here, disciples of Christ, sign up. Let's just be all Mormons. Let's just be all members of the Unification Church. I think, I think that that's just creating another religion. It's not, it's not solving the problem. I think we need to start with religious difference, and we need to accept it. We need to stop pretending that we're going to make one universal religion. It's not going to happen. So we, that's where we need to start. Then the second part of the quotation I liked more because it was talking about how we need to engage with one another, respectful of the differences, learn about one another, and speak to one another. I'm, I'm all for that. I'm all for that. And I think that is the way forward. But I think the way forward is not with a hope that we will either create one new religion that will unify all the others by pretending to be universal when it's always particular. Religions are particular. I'm speaking English right now. I'm not speaking language. I'm not speaking in general. There's no way to speak in general. There's no language in general. There's no religion in general. There's no universal language. There's no universal religion. So if you want to speak religion, you're going to be speaking in a particular way. And I think we need to give up on the universal hope, and we need to go for here are the differences, what are they? Can I understand them? Can I tolerate them? Can I respect them? Can I celebrate them? That's the, that's the goal. Tolerance without understanding is an empty virtue. And I think that understanding has to be rooted in, in differences rather than in hopes for uh, collapsing them all into one thing. So thank you for that quote, and that's my response. Sir? I'd like to just start by saying I applaud the idea of having more education on religion in public schools and all schools. Um, but when you mentioned the biggest obstacles to that, you mentioned the myth of constitutionality and controversy. My immediate thought, because um, I know a lot of people who are educators, would not be either of those, but where would we find the time? Because there are so many other things that we're being bombarded with, you know, Johnny and Susie are behind in math and science and, you know, they have to make their scores on so on. How would you propose to a school board um, that they work this into their curriculum? How would you, how would you talk them into it? Okay, thank you. Um, it's a great question. Uh, my answer is historical answer, and it, it is that public school curriculum has always changed. But even as it's changed, everybody's always said the same thing, which is, how can we change the public school curriculum? <laughs> public school curriculum started in New England public schools with Hebrew and Greek. How could a public school student come out of high school without knowing Hebrew and Greek? I think you've noticed we don't have that requirement anymore. Um, when I was in school, all the rage was home economics and shop. Everybody had to take that. Um, I don't know what happened. I don't know when it came in, but it was only in for like five or seven shining years. Um, but it was there. Um, I also, by the way, this is an aside, but I was subject to the experiment of the open classroom, which was basically a school in this. Actually, it looked a lot like this. A school here with like 15 classes meeting at the same time when no one could hear anything that anyone was saying. Um, computer science. When I was, you know, I don't want to date myself, but when I was in high school, we had one computer science course, and it was with one computer. It was about the size of that pulpit, but t two or three times bigger, and had the computing power of, you know, one billionth of your iPhone. And it had ticker tape. Ticker tape, you know, chads, had hanging chads <laughs> on the computer. We decided that computer science was important and we now teach it. Public education is about priorities. When the public decides it's a scandal for us not to know anything about the world, 
in which religion pushes people into war, in which religion moves economies, in which religion elects presidents, then we will teach it in the public schools. As long as we imagine that it doesn't matter, then we won't teach it. Where could it be? There are, you can do a course, an elective course in the world's religions in high schools now, where you're not taking away, students have electives in basically every school district. I will say that I don't know that really 12 years of math is an absolute non-negotiable requirement for public schools. How many of us who took 12th grade math have ever used anything from 12th grade math? I don't use calculus in my life. I, I understand that people should know it, but I'm not sure that that would be an absolute non-starter that we could say, eh, 11 years is enough. So I, I, do, I think we can make choices. And I think public school curriculums change, and they always have. Sir. Uh, let me try to ask you, I, th I think, a slightly more difficult question on that same subject. I, I, I agree with you in theory that we need to learn about other religions, and a comparative religion class is a hell of an idea for public schools, theoretically. But you seem to think that the, the culture war clashes that go on exist only in sort of the unreality of TV. And I think that's completely wrong. The, in the real world, the Christian Coalition and other groups have put 15,000 people on local school boards in this country since 1988. In the real world, those people want to do nothing more than proselytize and get God back into schools and so forth. And when you give those people the tools to do that, that's exactly what they're going to do. In the real world, we have some 450 or 500 uh, local school districts using an elective Bible course put out by the National Council on Bible Curriculum in Public Schools, which is blatantly unconstitutional and whose sole purpose is to proselytize. Now, there is another alternative to that, the Bible Literacy Project, uh, which I'm sure you know about, which is better, uh, I think more moderate, more reasonable, more scholarly. But in the real world where uh, where fundamentalist Christians tend to dominate school boards, the elective Bible curriculums that get, that get accepted tend to be the ones that are essentially nothing more than a collection of fundamentalist pamphlets, uh, anti-creationist. In the real world, 30% of our science teachers uh, are creationists. And so in the real world, when you give school districts the power to teach something like that, you're not going to end up with what is this very civil and informed dialogue about world religions or about uh, learning about the Bible as a matter of sort of cultural literacy, you're going to end up with something that's simply proselytizing. Your comment. Okay. I'm tempted to pepper my answer with in the real world, in the real world, in the real world, but I will refrain. I'll only do that a couple times. Um, in the real world, there are people teaching unconstitutional courses. In the real world, there are science teachers now who are creationists who are slipping that into the curriculum. But we also have in America um, groups like the American Civil Liberties Union who sue teachers and sue school districts who do these courses when they're unconstitutional. I think there's less danger of violations of the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment, which is what we're talking about, in courses, there are fewer dangers of that in courses that are explicitly about religion than there are in courses that are courses on literature or courses on biology. Because we don't really think of those places as places where people are going to be preaching for or against creationism or where they're going to be uh, talking about what they think about the Bible which can happen in an English course. So I think the level of scrutiny of courses on the world's religions like we see at, um, in Modesto, California, which um, you didn't speak about, uh, is very high. And I think the likelihood in those courses is very low that we're going to have people using them for proselytizing purposes. And I think the likelihood that if they do, which I think would happen, I don't deny that that wouldn't happen, I think the likelihood is if they do, that does happen, that people, they would be sued, which is essential for this. Um, what's the alternative? The alternative is to say, we're not going to talk about this in the public schools, and we're going to have another generation of secretaries of state 
and presidents taking us to war in countries where we don't speak the language, where we don't know anything about the culture, and we don't know the religion, and we imagine that we know something about the world. I think that's a scandal, and I think that's, that's unacceptable. So I would rather take my risks on saying, let's uh, educate the public about what's allowed in these courses, let's educate teachers to teach them, and then let's let the ACLU loose on whoever isn't doing it right. I, I think that's the way forward. <clears throat> Over here. Thank you for coming to Grand Rapids, Dr. Prothera. Um, I have taught at Grand Rapids Community College for 23 years, and uh, back in the 60s, I was a student here. <laughs> and um, I just really appreciate these diversity lectures that we have here at uh, GRCC. Um, you've already answered my question that GRCC should have a class in uh, world religions and uh, maybe a class in the literature of the Bible. Um, I proposed such a class a few years ago and I was told there wouldn't be enough interest. And I disagree with that um, just from my knowledge of my own students. Um, they would uh, enjoy, sign up for an elective class um, non-devotional, non-proselytizing on uh, the basic literature genres of the Bible. How do I run that by the administration again? Okay, that's a great question. Um, and I'll take that question and then um, we'll do one more because I think we need to stop. Um, but I'm happy to take, um, to take uh, questions privately afterwards. Um, we have some data. There's some data. I, I love administrators. I love my president, I love my provost, I love my dean. Um, deans and provosts and presidents understand certain things, but one thing they totally understand is they understand numbers and they understand money. They understand seats in courses. So there's actually some pretty good data about how religious studies courses enroll, and they enroll really well. This is not some obscure arena that people aren't interested in. So you can find data. Um, there was a, a story on Newsweek magazine a few weeks ago, and if you email me, I'll send you the, the sites about growing enrollments in religious studies courses nationwide, particularly after 9-11. Um, there's some good, uh, there was a similar article in Time magazine about four or five years ago, and there's also some good data from the uh, Chronicle of Higher Education the courses that I teach at Boston University, um, we typically only have rooms that are about the size of 150 to 200, and I have no problem filling up those rooms when I teach courses on the world's religions. People want to take these courses. So, um, and these aren't requirements either at my school. You're not required, you just take it because you want to learn something about this, uh, the subject. So I think the language, I think the message to Dean should be that this is an important subject, because you can't understand the world, you know, all the yada, 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 all the stuff I just said tonight. But then also, and, you know, you'll get good enrollments. You know, it's the win-win. So that would that, be my argument. Okay, we'll take this question over here from this gentleman, and then I apologize to the others who are waiting, but I'm happy to, uh, to take uh, questions myself. Um, good evening, Dr. Petro. Uh, just a question in regards to the concept of pass up the same mountain. Um, I've always kind of struggled with that concept um, and somewhat supported it. And I guess really what my question is, I've always looked at that mountain as um, more of a spiritual mountain, not necessarily a one of religiosity. So my question to you is, I, I see on the inside of your most recent book, uh, you talk about religion looking to solve um, various human problems. Um, Islam looking to solve the problem of pride, Christianity looking to solve the problem of sin, uh, Buddhism's problem of chaos, et cetera, et cetera. And I guess um, in, my, in my mind, all those things are a singular problem that leads to the improvement of individual humans and humanity in general. So I, uh, I guess really my question is I just want you to respond to, I guess, the concept of spirituality versus religiosity. And if the mountain is more of a spiritual mountain and not a religious mountain, are they not leading to the same place? Yeah, okay, good. Thank you for that question. That makes a lot of sense to me. 
Um, I've been asked versions of this question a lot, and I think I have to say that I'm not a theologian. So I don't begrudge anyone who wants to say, who wants to make a theological claim, <clears throat> that in the end, the, the goals of each religion are the same because of some interesting, weird connection that you're drawing across them, right? So I'm not, I'm not opposed to that project theologically. Like, I, I have some of my best friends do that project. But, um, but I think what I'm saying, what I'm saying is that ordinary people in these religions, they're, they're not doing that. If you talk to them about what they're doing, they're not doing whatever synthetic mountain you, spiritual mountain you're talking about. It's not what they're doing. It requires you to imaginatively reimagine what they're doing. And see, I'm just kind of a historian of religions. I'm more interested in what actual religious people do rather than in kind of philosophizing and theolo theologizing about it and imagining it to be something else. So, <clears throat> so when I say, and thank you for that, when I say that the religions all start with a human predicament and they immediately have different diagnoses of the human problem. Christians say it's sin. Buddhists say it's suffering. Confucians say it's chaos. Muslims say it's pride. As soon as you do that, you're running off in very different directions. You're solving very different problems. I think part of what that analysis does is shows us that the religions aren't really as competitive in a way as we imagine. Because Buddhists aren't fighting with Christians over how to solve the problem of sin. Buddhists are just ignoring the problem of sin. And Christians aren't fighting with Buddhists over how to solve the problem of suffering. Christians are like, suffering, you know? It's not so bad, I mean. <laughs> and you know, Jews aren't solving the problem of reincarnation and we're born over and over and over again like is the problem of Hinduism because they don't even believe in that. So I, I draw the analogy to the religions as less like competitors in a you know, political fight where only one gets to be president, you know, like in the U.S., and more like sports. You know, if you say, you know, which sport is best at hitting home runs? <laughs> Baseball, you know. They don't do that in lacrosse. They don't do that in soccer. So which is best at salvation? You know, sin and salvation. Christianity. That's no knock on Hinduism. Hindus aren't trying to achieve salvation. Neither are Buddhists, neither are Jews, neither are Confucians. So I think if you look carefully at these traditions and you see what people are trying to do in them, you see they're heading off in different directions. Now, whether there is some way to imagine all the sports as kind of doing some spiritual athletic thing um, I'm not begrudging someone to come up with that kind of poetic reading, but I'm just saying on the face of it, you look at athletes in different sports, the baseball players are trying to hit home runs, the football players are trying to like spear the guy with their helmet and injure them and get concussions, <laughs> and the golfers are trying you know, to get the ball in the hole in the least possible sh strokes, and those are just different projects. And so, so and I also believe, this is the universalist part of me, you know, I believe that humans have more than one predicament. I believe that actually all these predicaments that we see in these religions are all human predicaments. And I think that when Confucians look at the problem of chaos, that they're looking at a real human problem. And when Christians look at the problem of sin, they're looking at a real human problem. And when Jews look at the problem of exile, they're looking at a real human problem. And that we can, we can not only appreciate other religions by looking at them, but also appreciate our own predicaments and see them in, in new lights by looking at how other re religious traditions respond to them. So I'll end on that note. I'm happy to uh, th uh, thank you all for coming. I really enjoyed, enjoyed it. Thank you to um, GRCC and the Diversity Learning Center for having me and for the folks here at the church for sponsoring this. And I'm happy to take questions up here um, myself. And oh, do we have, we have a, a book thing or something too? I have a book signing as well. Okay, so the, the, I guess I'm going to go somewhere I'll, and sign I'll, books. Yes. But I'm also happy to, uh, mm -hmm. to, to answer questions as well. Okay, thank you all for coming.